actually play the part all within yourself. And then believe it 100%. As we are told in John's letter, the fifth chapter of his first epistle. If we believe that he hears us in all that we ask of him, then we know that we have obtained the request made of him. Well, if you get the right God, you have no doubts in your mind as to whether he heard you or not. For you know you heard it, and that's God. But if you're not quite sure that he heard it, because there are three billion talking to him, begging, well, then you may be not quite sure that he heard you. Maybe you don't think you're good enough, but you can't deny that you hear your own mind. You hear your own inner conversation. You hear your own inner speech. Well, if you know that one is God, well, then you are sure he heard you. Now you are told in that fifth chapter, the 15th verse of first epistle of John. If we know that he hears us in all that we ask of him, then we know that we have already obtained the request made of him. Well, all right. There's an interval between that imaginal act and this fulfillment as there is between the creative act of a man and the birth of that child. Every little thing has an interval of time between the act and its fulfillment. A horse will take 12 months. A woman takes 9 months. The little sheep will take 5 months. A chicken will take 21 days. There are intervals of time. So the Bible teaches every vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens. It will flower. If it be late, then wait. For it is sure, and it will not be late. Different intervals of time. So it may take me a longer time. In this case with this man, two months to bring back 4,000 who were unemployed. To put his mind at rest that he doesn't have now to feel that he's going to be fired. He can put in now the extra time. Only a little while, three years and two months will complete his 30 years with Jones and Lockland. And then, what's a man of his age? Six more years and then social security. So he would have both. If it happened now, he wouldn't have it. He would be cut on social security and he would be let out without a good retirement fund. So she goes back and she reminds him that it happened before. He couldn't afford the roof for the house. And she said, I will see the roof on the house. I remember when it needed a, a roof. And so she simply remember, she told him, I recall telling you, I remember when it needed it. Well, soon after something happened in his work, he got the money and the roof is on. The wife wanted an organ, couldn't afford the organ, all right. She said, I remember when you didn't have one. She has the organ. And she took one after the other. Of all these things, he still, with all the, the evidence in the world, he is still working on some outside God. He thinks he's doing the wrong thing. He feels that if, perchance, that man is simply a devil incarnate, and he's taken me from my real God, which means something external to himself that he fashions out of his own mind and fashions with his hand because all these little nonsenses that you buy and stick them up as holy objects. First of all, no artist really ever designed them. It's an offense to speak of an artist when you see these horrible monstrous monstrosities that we buy and stick around the place and call them religious objects. So, Find who he is. He is the living God. He is a dead God. You want to find, read the 115th Psalm about the kind of gods that men worship. The whole Psalm is devoted to the false God that the whole vast world worships. He has eyes, but he sees not. Ears, and he hears not. Feet, and he walks not. Hands, and he touches not. Just a dead thing made by human hands. When the living God is within man as his own wonderful human imagination. 
So I tell you that all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. All things exist in the human imagination. And everything you see as an objective reality was produced by imagining. Think of one thing. Just think of one thing that would simply deny it. You can't think of one thing. So you go to the moon. You first had to imagine it. Had to imagine everything concerning the machine that took you to the moon. Everything in the world first has to be imagined and then executed. All right. The intelligence to do it will come, but you take the blueprint first and conceive it and dwell in it as though it were true. And no power on earth can stop it from becoming so. Your visions will clarify itself. At night, it's a different kind of a night. Your days are different. You see people differently. You can't walk by any man and not see him God incarnate. Can't do it. Even if he has the most horrible background. And he said simply, well, a murderer. And it's proven that he is. You still see God incarnate. But so sound asleep, the poor thing doesn't know. If you could only just get to it and show him that he really is God incarnate. <clears throat> and the one he thought he killed, is he has been restored to life. Not to the senses of man, but he is restored in a world just like this. Terrestrial, just like this. About his business, he continues his work. Until he too awakens from this dream of life. But all will awaken eventually. But why not start now? Start now to tell man who he really is. God and man are one. Man is all imagination and God is man. And exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And that is God himself. Nothing but God in the universe. All God. And eventually you and I will awake. And because God is one, not two, you and I are one. Without loss of identity, that's one of the strangest mysteries in the world. Without loss of identity, we are one. I know that from my own personal experience, we are one. And yet, I am individualized. And you are individualized. And we tend forever and forever toward ever greater and greater individualization. And yet, we are one. And I will bring that out to the best of my ability as we proceed with these series of lectures. You will hear it. But tonight, if you're here for the first time and you want something practical, you apply what I've told you. First, have an objective. You must have an objective. You can say, well, I don't know what I want. Well, all right. Come back the next time. Ask yourself, what would I like of life? Don't be ashamed to name it. What would I like of life? So then, try to get some objective. Now, prayer, as far as I'm concerned, is nothing more than the subjective appropriation of the objective hope. That is the way to success. I appropriate it subjectively. How do I appropriate a state subjectively? Well, suppose now, this very moment, I wanted a ball, an ordinary baseball. But there isn't a baseball in the room, all right. But I want one. I would actually assume that I am holding a baseball in my hand until I could feel it. You think you can't feel it? Well, now try it. <coughs> try to feel what it would be like if you held a baseball. Now, to prove that you have held it, see what it feels like, the difference now, a tennis ball. See any difference? Or like a golf ball. See any difference? A piece of silk. You feel any difference? If you can distinguish between these many objects, though they are subjective, then they must exist somewhere. If you can actually separate them in your mind's eye and distinguish between these objects, 
I can begin to feel, begin to sense, begin to smell a rose. Well, a rose doesn't smell or doesn't actually have the odor of another flower. I can detect the rose. Now, a lily, an Easter lily. I can detect that. But what does it do? Well, I'm going to get them. Someone will think of Neville and send him a flower. And it's going to be the flower that I'm going to actually feel and touch and smell. It works that way. Money has an odor. It's unlike any odor in the world. It's more fragrant to the miser than the most marvelous perfume in the world. He can tell it. He put a money bag to his face and it's like putting roses to mine. He loves it. He can smell money. He can feel it. Money has a distinct feel about it. Put a $20 bill in your hand and ask you to feel it and then put another piece of paper in your hand and you can tell the difference. There's a difference. It is an odor to it. All this is part of the inner man that all things are possible to him. Try it. Before you condemn it, try it. And if you have the evidence to support my claim, well, then it doesn't matter what the world will tell you. If he laughs at you, so what? So they laughed at everyone who had an idea that seemed a little bit off-center. Always laughed at him. They laughed at the idea of going to the moon. Well, now it's a, an accomplished fact. There are still those who won't believe it happened, you know, because they don't want to believe it ever happened. There are those who said you couldn't go down and actually live underwater. Now we have a submarine. There are still those who won't believe it. You can present them with all the facts in the world, and they won't believe it. So I tell you, you try it first, and if it proves itself in performance, it doesn't really matter what the whole vast world thinks. Go about your father's business, which is yourself, and then live a full and wonderful life in this world of Caesar. And the day will come, you'll actually depart this world. I mean this age. Because those who are departing it now, unless they are awakened, they'll still find themselves in a world just like this. But those who have awakened, who have experienced the second birth, the birth from above, find themselves in an entirely different age where they're all imagination and they are perfect and wherever they go everything is perfect they don't have to raise a finger to make anything perfect because they're perfect all things must conform to them or they're perfect that's heaven so heaven is not an area it's not a realm it's a body and when that body is awakened within you which is the wonderful human imagination, completely awake, then wherever you go clothed in that body that is completely awake, everything is perfect. If you found yourself in a forest of dead trees, they'd all burst into foliage. In the desert, they would all bloom like the rose. Because you are there. No blind man, deaf man, no handicapped man could stand in your presence. He would be instantly transformed into a perfect man because you are perfect. That's heaven. It's harmony. So it's not a place where you're going to go, poorly streets and all that nonsense. No. It's just simply you in a world that is perfect because you are perfect. And the day will come, you will awaken that body for it's in you now. That body is in you, but it's sound asleep. One day you will experience the resurrection and you'll know the mystery of the resurrection when you rise and you rise within yourself. For the grave in which Christ is buried, which the Lord is buried, is your own skull. That's where he's buried. And in that tomb where he is buried one day, he will awake and he will come out of that tomb. And it's you who comes out the tomb, and you'll know who you are. He is buried in every child in the world, this universal being, and yet one. Millions of us, and yet only one Lord. And that one Lord, in his fullness, is buried in you, individually. 
And when you awaken, you are here. So tonight, take a go. Make it a lovely go. Either for yourself or for another. For any time that you exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of another, you're mediating God to that other. So, bring a friend before your mind's eye. Represent him to yourself as the man or the woman that you would like them to be. And don't tell them, ask for no praise, just assume that they're talking to you and telling you the most marvelous news about themselves. And you congratulate them on that good news. And go your own way. Believe in the reality of that imaginal act. It may happen tomorrow. It may happen the day after, or a week later, or a month later. It has its own appointed hour, and it is ripening, and it's going to flower. So don't be concerned. Leave it alone. <coughs> and it will come to pass. So this is what I mean by feeling is the secret. I catch the mood, the feeling that would be mine if I were what I want to be. I don't have to touch something, I can if I want to, but it's the mood I'm speaking of. What would the feeling be like if she were well, if she were this? And then you catch it, just as though it is true. You always go to the end, and the end is where you begin. You're always imagining ahead of our evidence. So go to the end, and feel the end, and then dwell in that end, even though reason denies it and your senses deny it. You turn your back upon the doubters. That is your senses and what reason dictates. That's the hell or the devil or Satan in the world. That's the doubter. So you turn your back upon it. And then you walk as though things were as you want them to be. And living in that assumption, it slowly hardens into fact. Even though at the moment of the assumption it was denied by reason, an assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. So you learn to assume and learn to persist in the assumption, and it will come to pass.